رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فاللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين ثم اما بعد Today's khutbah is about a very beautiful prayer that was made by Musa alayhi salam at a very critical juncture in his life. Many of you know that the Qur'an is full of many stories of prophets and in all of those stories of the prophets you find a consistent feature. At one point or another these prophets make dua. And a lot of these prayers are mentioned at very critical junctures, at a, at a moment of great desperation or great difficulty when no other option is there they turn to Allah and they make dua. Those of you, I mean, all of you here are familiar with the idea of storytelling and how stories move from one major scene to the next major scene to the next major scene, how things progress in a story. Actually, the Qur'an's stories aren't just stories, they're actual history. But you learn something about du'as in the Qur'an. Things move from one major event to the next major event and the bridge between them is a du'a. In other words, the door to some kind of ease would not have opened up if a dua wasn't there in between. This is the sort of thing that happens with Musa alayhi salam at one point in his life. And, and you know also that the life of Musa alayhi salam is something that's sporadic all over the Qur'an. And there are so many events of his life that are captured more than any other prophet in the Qur'an. Actually, he's in a sense the, the most mentioned prophet and the most celebrated prophet of the Qur'an. Because he's also a, uh, an example for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in that he has a very similar career to the Messenger of Allah. I'll just make a couple of quick comments about that. Musa alayhi salam had two major audiences. The first major audience he had was Fir'aun and his people, basically the, the disbelievers. And then once he migrated out of Egypt, his primary audience was his own people. And these people, many of them were hypocrites. And they gave him a hard time. Even though they believed in him, they didn't believe in him. There was a, was a confusion between those two things. This is very similar to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because his primary audience was the Quraysh, the disbelievers. Just like Musa's audience alayhi salam was Fir'aun. And just like Musa alayhi salam parted and, and departed from Egypt, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa also along with the believers left Makkah and they moved to Medina. The kinds of challenges the Prophet faced in Medina were from people who already believed. Munafiqun, even among, not among the Muslims, but also hypocrites among the people of the book who already believed also. And so we have the challenge of Musa alayhi salam and his audience, paralleled with the challenge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his life in Medina. So there are many, and that's why the Quran mentions him so much. There's so much of his life that will become, serve as an example, as a case study for our Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and the struggles that, are, that the Muslims are going through whether they were in Mecca or they were in Medina. Regardless, there are some events of his life that Allah particularly highlights and you should also know that I was talking to a rabbi not too long ago about the life of Moses and you know how big of a deal is the seerah of Musa alayhi salam in Jewish studies and four of the five major books of the Hebrew Bible are actually dedicated to his life. The majority of them are just covering the life of Musa alayhi salam. So he's a very fundamental figure also. Of course, it's called Torah Moshe in their tradition, the Torah of Musa. That's what they call it uh, on their own anyway. But regardless, this prayer that I wanted to get to is something that happened before Musa alayhi salam be became a prophet. He becomes a messenger of Allah when Allah calls him to the mountain and reveals himself to him speaks to him directly and tells him that he's been chosen I'm the one that has chosen you, Allah told him by the burning bush so listen to what's being revealed to you right, that story is mentioned in the Bible it's of course also mentioned in the Quran but many years before then what happened with Musa salam was he was living his life in Egypt and he was actually raised in the, in the palace of the Pharaoh and as this life of kind of a prince you know, that's where the Disney film borrows its name, the Prince of Egypt, right? Because he was in fact raised as a prince. Something happened. He used to go out into the city to volunteer, even though he was very well off. You can argue a millionaire, very strong. The Quran mentions how strong he was as a young man. You know, He was extremely knowledgeable and well, uh, sensible young man. He was actually someone who had good judgment, even though young people don't have good judgment normally. And on top of that, he was wealthy. Well, now wealthy young people really don't have good judgment. 
And on top of that, he was very intellectual and knowledgeable. وَعِلْمًا Allah gave him knowledge also. And then he gave him a spiritual connection to himself. A young man who's wealthy, spiritual, knowledgeable, wise, I mean, he's got, and strong. He's got all these incredible qualities as a young man. And Allah describes him as a person of Ihsan. وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ That is how we compensate the people of Ihsan. In other words, he's got a deep, profound connection with Allah also. So he goes in the city to volunteer because you know, you know that he was from Bani Israel. Even though he was treated as royalty, he's from the Israelites, the slave people in Egypt. And it was illegal for him to help them. He couldn't just go into the city and help those people. So he used to go in the middle of the afternoon, which is when the time the, the Spanish call it the siesta, you might be familiar. Qaylula, the Arabs call it. There's a time in the day where everybody's asleep. Nobody's awake. They are, it's the, the sun is too hot, so they don't even make their slaves do the work. So this would be the time that he would go and help the people and volunteer and finish some of their jobs because he won't get caught. Because you can't help the slaves, why are you helping them? So he would go, Hina ghaflatim min ahliha, Quran will describe, at a time where everybody's knocked out. The city, nobody's around. So he goes at this time and the city, the streets are empty and he sees two people that are fighting each other. I won't, I'm not here to tell you that part of the story. But short, the, the, the short version of it is, when he gets closer, he finds one of them is from his own people, the Israelites, and the other one is from the, 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 the ruling class. هَذَا مِنْ عَدُوِّهِ Quran says, the, this one's from his enemy people. So he got upset that they're beating up my Muslim brother, and he goes and he throws a punch at the soldier, whoever was beating him up. And when he throws one punch, the guy, فَوَكَزَهُ مُوسَى فَقَضَى عَلَيْهِ Musa alayhi salam punched him, and he was dead on the spot. The guy died on the spot. Now, you've killed what you can call, you killed a police officer. You know, when a murder happens in a city, of course the cops are alerted. If a cop is killed, then the cops go crazy. Now they're gonna hunt somebody down. One of their own, that's, that's a different story. Musa alayhi salam, in a sense, you can argue has killed a cop. He didn't intend to, but that's what's happened. Now they're looking for him. They're just, there's a blank, and they don't know who did it. But actually it came out, the guy who he actually helped, ratted him out and said he's the one who did it. Now everybody's looking for Musa. And he escapes Egypt, barely surviving with his life. Okay? The entire city is on a hunt for him. He's the most wanted man in the land. And he escapes into the desert. Obviously, no, no one in their right mind would think about escaping into the desert. It's death anyway. It's, there's no shelter. There's no water. You're going to, what, you're going to survive one or two days and you're going to be dead. But he goes into the, into the desert and he asks Allah for guidance as he walked into the desert. عَسَى رَبِّي أَنْ يَهْدِيَنِي سَوَىٰ السَّبِيلِ Maybe my master will guide me to the straightest path. And that's what Allah did. Allah gave him a, like a divine GPS. You know, in a desert, if you're walking, you can walk in a circle, you won't even know. Well, Musa alayhi salam, he walked straight. تِلْقَاءَ مَدْيَنِ He walked straight in the direction of Madian, somewhere he's never been before. And Madian was a place where there was water, there's a, there's a township, and this is Arab land now. Okay? So he gets there directly. And just, just about when he's about to be dehydrated and die of, of thirst, he gets there and he sees water. And he starts sipping on the water. Now he's you know, destitute, desperate, homeless, fugitive from the law. And he's sipping on this water, barely surviving. And he sees two women. You know, he sees two women and Allah says about them, تذودان. They're, uh, to put it mildly, they're playing tug of war with their animals. Meaning they're holding their animals back from drinking the water. Now obviously in the desert, there's a few places where you have water. So everybody brings their animals to feed them there. And these girls are holding their animals back, not letting them drink. So he, he gets confused, what's going on with you two? Ma khatbukuma. He goes to them and asks, what's wrong with you two? What's your situation? So they said, لَا نَسْقِي حَتَّى يُسْطِرَ الرِّعَى وَأَبُونَا شَيْخٌ كَبِيرٌ We can't feed our animals until this entire flock, everybody, all the men are done. Because these men down there, basically what they're saying is, those men are perverts. When we go down there and serve our animals, they start whistling at us, howling at us, hitting on us or whatever, making inappropriate comments. We don't want to deal with any of that nonsense. So we let all these men finish giving their animals their drink and leave. Then we go feed our animals. And until then we have to keep pulling on our animals because our animals don't understand that. They just see the water and they want to go. And the reason we're working so hard and the reason we're, we're out here and we're not down there, why don't you have a man in the family? They explain, Wa abuna shaykhun kabir. Our dad is an old man. He's not capable of working anymore. Even though that's not the subject of my khutbah, the subject of my khutbah is, is actually the dua that, that comes. But what I wanted to highlight to you is Allah in fact mentions 
a very strange situation. Typically, you would imagine that the head of the household or the male in the household is going to earn the income. They're going to make the money. But Allah mentions a situation where these two girls have to go in a hostile environment. It's not a friendly environment. These are men that are not friendly towards women, not respectful towards women. That's why they have to hold back. And they don't have a choice because their father is too old. He can't do it. There are situations in families where, you know, it's not the ideal situation, but it happens. Women sometimes have to work. They have to go seek an education. They're the only one that can, they can uh, take care of the family. That happens. There's nothing un-Islamic about that. That's just what it is. That's life. And there's a reason Allah mentions these things because these situations occur. And it's not right for us to look at some family situation and say, oh, look, their daughter works. Oh look, his wife work, etc. And it's not right for you and I to make those judgments. We don't know what their family situation is. In any case, these young girls say that we can't, you know, we can't go down there. Musa alayhi salam, I mentioned to you, was a strong man. He just grabbed their animals, went down there, moved the other people around like they're flies, fed their animals, brought them back, and then didn't say any, not a word to them, and went back, tawalla ila dhil. Then he went back towards the shade. And that's where he made this dua. So this man, who's barely, barely alive himself, saw these two women that needed help, helped them out, and then went back, didn't ask for money, didn't ask for thanks, didn't say his name, nothing. Went back into the shade and said, Rabbi inni lima anzalta ilayya min khayrin faqir. Master, there's no doubt about it that I, in regards to whatever you send my way, whatever you send from above towards me, any good you want, min khayr istanawwa, any good you want to send me, I could totally use it. I'm bankrupt. Faqir in Arabic, faqr literally means for the back to be broken. Okay? When you have so much burden on your back that you can't take anymore and your back snaps. Like some of you work out if you're squatting, if you put too much weight on the machine on the rack, you could sense I can't take anymore. That's actually when you're about to experience faqr. Your back is about to snap. He's basically saying I am disabled at this point. I can use, I'll take any good you give me. I'm in this desperate situation. He turns to Allah and he makes this profound, profound dua. This has two meanings. The first meaning is, Ya Allah, I don't have a home. I don't have family anymore. I'm by myself. I know nobody. I, I, I got nothing. To, I, all I, all, the only shelter I have is the shade of this tree. That's all I got. Anything, any rizq at this point, I'm not going to be picky. Whatever you send my way, because by, by the way, he was raised as royalty. When you're raised as royalty, you eat expensive food, you sit in comfortable housing, your ride is nice, everything is kind of a certain class, right? And there are certain things you're not so comfortable with. Like, you know, if you're, for example, if you make a certain amount of money, then you're like, you're going to go book a hotel in some other town. You're not going to go get to know one star, half star motel. You're going to get at least three stars, aren't you? You have some standards. There's some kind of, or if you're going to rent a car, you're not going to rent like some used dinky Hyundai or something. You're going to say, hey, what's, what's the upgrade? You have certain standards. Musa alayhi salam has actually been raised, you could argue with a silver spoon. He's been raised in pretty elite standards. But he's in this desperate situation right now, and he's not picky. He's saying, Ya Allah, whatever you give me, I will take. Whatever of any kind of good you decide, and I know that it will come only from you. It can only come from you because I got no worldly resources left. That's why Inzal is mentioned. It can only come from the heavens now. I'll, I'll totally take it. I'm bankrupt. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be whiny or picky. This, by the way, by extension, is somebody lost a job. They used to have a high-paying tech job. They were making six figures. Now they don't have that job anymore. They've been looking for a new job, a year goes by, two years go by, three years go by, the savings have run out, there's no money left, they can't even pay the rent anymore, somebody offers them a job to dr drive a truck, somebody offers them a job to work at a grocery store, somebody offers them a job to drive a cab, and he says, look man, I'm a programmer, I can't do this, this is beneath me. Yes, it is beneath you, but at this point, it's been three years, you need to be realistic, whatever you can get, you take. Al-Kasibu Habibullah The one who earns, works hard and earns an income is beloved to Allah. It's not humiliating. Hard work is never humiliating. And just on that side note, I go out of my way, if, especially when I travel to the Muslim world. I go out of my way if I take a cab or a limo or anything else. 
to make sure I get to know the driver and to make sure I get to like remind them that what they do is very honorable and noble. Because this is actually a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. To remind people that do hard work, that they are honored by Allah. You know what's happened in many of our cultures? The driver, the waiter, the cleaner, you know, these people, they're treated like trash. Like they have no respect in society. The opposite is true in our deen. Musa is saying, whatever job you get me, whatever provision you provide me, I'm not going to be picky. That's a gift from Allah. Rizq is a gift from Allah. A job is a gift from Allah. So now, this is why our deen is so beautiful. The guy who collects the trash, the guy who's cleaning up the bathrooms, all of these people are dignified people because they work hard to provide for their families. They, they are in fact kasib, and therefore they are Habibullah, they're beloved to Allah. And how can they be beloved to Allah and despised by us? How can we look down on someone who Allah loves? That's the first meaning of this dua. But there's another meaning. The other meaning of this dua is that the word khair can also not just mean worldly good. Ya Allah, whatever food you give me, whatever shelter you give me, whatever job you give me, I'll take it. Khair can also mean good deeds. Khair also means good deeds. He's also saying, Ya Allah, I know I made a mistake. I didn't intend to kill this man, but I did it. And now I've, as a result, I am in this desperate situation. But I know because I have a sin in my past that is haunting me. Because you, when you make a mistake like that, you think about the mistake you've made. And you, if you really have a good heart towards Allah, then you want to make it up to Allah, don't you? You're like, how do I make sure Allah forgave me? And how do I make sure that this debit in my account is credited with some good deeds? Ya Allah, I was desperate, I'm dying, I'm dehydrated, but these two women needed help, I immediately helped them. Ya Allah, if there's any other opportunity to do any other good, let me know. I could use it. I know I need to fill my account with more good deeds. So even though he's desperate himself, he's dehydrated himself, he's, not survive, he's barely surviving himself, he's also starving for more good deeds to help people, to do something good. And here the khair that he did was not more worship or fasting or ibadah. His, his good deed was helping somebody who needed help. You know, he's in a situation where he needs help, isn't he? Actually, he's far more in need than those two women. But there's something even in his desperate situation he could help with. What are we learning here? You may have a difficult situation, I may have a difficult situation. But even though we have difficulty from one end, we're still very capable of helping others in other ways. We're the, the capable, Allah has given us, maybe we're debilitated, incapacitated from one side, but very capable from other sides. And you can still provide help. This is the desperation a slave should have, that I, whatever you give me, I'll take. I will accept. And so from here, what happens in this remarkable story is a fa. Fa ja'at ihdahuma tamshi ala istihya. Quran summarizes the story. These girls received help. So they went back home. When they go back home, their father says, Why did you come back home so early? You usually wait until all the men are done, right? How are you home four hours early? They say, Well, there was this man, he helped us out. Well, what, did, what did he say to you? Did he ask for money? Did he ask for any? They said, no, he didn't. He just went, looked like he was making dua or something. So the father says, go get him. What a great guy. I mean, this is a society of terrible men, right? Well, that's already been indicated. So he's a great human being. We should meet him. We should get to know this person. So one of them comes back and then says, my dad's calling you. He wants to pay you. Inna abi yad'uka liyajziyaka ajra ma saqayta lana. He, my dad is calling you to compensate you for the, the service you provided us, the animals that you fed for us. Now here's the thing, ask yourself, did Musa السلام, volunteer to help those, those, those women for money? Did he want to get paid? No. He did it because it's a good deed. He did it, you could say, for the sake of Allah, isn't it? And now these, this, one of these girls is coming back and saying, my dad wants to pay you. If you and I were there, we would have been like, no sister, Jazakallahu khairan, this was for the fee sabilillah, I cannot take anything from this dunya, because I did it for Allah, and Allah will provide for me, I actually made dua to Allah that He will send something from the sky, so I'm waiting for that, you go home. Thank you. But thanks, but no thanks. I expect my reward from Allah. Musa alayhi is, salam is much smarter than we are. He understands, I just asked Allah for help, and this girl showed up. And that's why the Qur'an says, He made dua, therefore this girl showed up. فَاجَأَتِحْدَاهُمَا 
In other words, that girl offering from her father's behalf that he wants to compensate you is actually the help of Allah. That's the help of Allah. You don't turn that away. He went right away, you know, when he got to him. He went to him and his life completely changed because he took that opportunity. What I'm trying to get at here is that you and I have something called takalluf. We have something called a little bit of hesitation or when somebody's offering you help, no, 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 I don't. You're looking for a job, you're looking for maybe a loan, maybe you're looking for some financial help, some kind of help. And people are coming, hey, I heard that you're in some situation, I'd like to help. No, I'm okay, alhamdulillah. You're not okay, dude. You didn't go begging. Somebody came to you. They offered you help. That is how Allah, what did you expect? Allah will send an angel to you? And he's gonna come with, you know, golden currency for you from the sky and then your problems will be solved? This is how Allah helps. This is how Allah Azza helps. You know, this is, they say in, in Arabic, there's an old saying, عِزُّ الرَّجُلْ إِسْتِغْنَاؤُهُ عَنِ النَّاسِ The dignity of a man is that he doesn't need other people. Nobody likes to be in need. I don't want to be in a situation where somebody says, here, here's $20. I don't want to be in that situation. No, no, as part of our dignity, we want to be independent. We want to be able to provide for ourselves. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. I agree with that. And that's something that is an axiom across any dignified society. But at the same time, when help is offered to you, not when you went begging for help, when help is offered to you, then understand that that may be from the risk of Allah. Then you don't turn it away. Then you actually consider it. Then you actually consider it. People turn away all kinds of risk. People are coming, you have daughters, they're not getting married, you don't know anybody. Somebody says, hey, there's a proposal. We can say, no, no, alhamdulillah, we're okay. What do you mean we're okay? What did you, you're not okay. If you were okay, your girls would have been married already. You complain about that every day. Now somebody comes forward and you're too embarrassed to accept the help or accept a recommendation. This is us not understanding how dua works. We turn to Allah in desperate times and do two things. We ask Allah, we, we let Allah know we're not going to be picky. Whatever He gives us, we're going to take. We're going to accept, we're going to be grateful for. And two, we're going to be desperate to do good things. Because the more good things you do, the more Allah opens the door to rizq. That's actually the lesson here also. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us truly understand the spirit of the du'as that are captured in the Qur'an and help bring the rizq in our life that Allah wants to bring by means of sincere du'a to Him. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dhikr al-Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa khususan ala afdalihim wa khatam al-nabiyyin Muhammadin al-Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Yaqulu Allahu Azza wa Jal fi kitabihi al-Kareem ba'da an aqula a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim inna Allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi ya ayyuha alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim fil alamin innaka hamidun majid اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا موقوتا